Let's continue on. Lesson two, fair housing issues and matching and fill in the blank. And this is where you'll follow along with me and you'll do the matching exercises, fill in the blank exercises as well. So I'll do all the heavy lifting on this one. You follow along with your textbook. So here is our lesson objectives. Um, what we're really, these lesson objectives refer to uh, our studying about fair and equitable treatment in housing and in real estate transactions and the various laws that affect that. So in this chapter, we're going to focus on mandatory fair housing issues that all licensees must understand and be aware of. And we'll talk about the federal and state anti-discrimination acts and the various fair housing violations that it's your duties and responsibilities to treat all your clients and customers fairly and equally. So we're going to be discussing uh, the need to know uh, topics uh, on what conduct violates anti-discrimination and also how to avoid potential liability. Uh, we're going to talk about the protected classes. We're going to talk about the Fair Housing Acts. We're going to talk about the Illinois Human Rights Act. Uh, and we're going to talk about the very various disability acts, uh, the Americans with Disability Act and then disability protected under the Fair Housing Acts. And then we'll do some uh, interactive lessons that refer to uh, scenarios uh, where we have uh, uh, actions and activities that might uh, relate to fair housing and how you would handle uh, those if you were in the real estate business. Okay, let's begin our matching exercise. If you'll follow along with your textbook and kind of fill in the blank as I lead you through this, uh, this lesson, lesson two on fair housing issues. Number one, tell me what is an establishment intended to be available to everyone, either as a place of commerce, business, or business government? What's an establish? intended to be available, and particularly here we're talking about disability, either as a place of commerce, business, or business government. That's called a public accommodation. So a public accommodation is any public area that is used by the general public, and particularly it provides protection for the disabled in housing. Now there are many different sections to the Americans with Disability Act, which is what this refers to. Uh, some even including employment and other areas of, of life, if you will. But the area that we're most concerned about with ADA is its reference to uh, disability protection uh, in the general public. So this would include businesses, uh, government uh, offices, entertainment facilities, restaurants, anywhere the general public uh, congregates, the disability, uh, the, those with disabilities are protected there. Uh, again, there's another area of disability relating to real estate that we want to be familiar with, and that's disability protected under the Fair Housing Acts. Now that is basically referring to protecting the disabled in their pursuit of housing, particularly rentals, I would say. Okay, So we protected the disabled in two areas. One, through the ADA, through public discourse in public areas, and then we also protect the disabled under our uh, Fair Housing Acts. So we'll talk about more, more about these uh, in a little bit. Number two. What is the physical or mental impairment that substantially limits or curtails one or more major life activities? That is called a disability. And notice that we're talking about physical as well as mental impairments. So a disability isn't just physical impairments. It could also be mental impairments. And by the way, it also includes uh, those that are uh, chronic al alcoholics if they're in a treatment program. Uh, so they would be considered disabled and therefore uh, be able uh, to uh, afford themselves the protection under uh, the various uh, Fair Housing Acts, ADA and the Fair, Fair Housing Acts. So anyone with a physical or mental impairment including chronic alcoholism, if that particular person is in a, a, a alcohol treatment program or a drug treatment program. 
uh, if they're not in a treatment program, uh, they're not protected. Three, the lender ref who refuses to make mortgage loans in a neighborhood because of its ethnic or racial composition. That would be redlining. And uh, redlining really caused a lot of uh, problems in the 50s and 60s, and it led to a lot of uh, vacant uh, properties and what we know now is sort of the ghetto areas in many of the large cities because the lenders were refusing to make loans in certain undesirable neighborhoods. Uh, and all that meant is that no one was able to purchase the property because they couldn't get loans and therefore they became decayed and uh, abandoned and that uh, spread obviously into the whole area. So redlining was a major source of problems that we even have today with lenders refusing to make loans in various neighborhoods because of where the homes were located. And primarily they were in ethnic or racial uh, areas uh, that were considered un in undesirable areas for the lender. For the structural changes made to allow persons with disabilities the full enjoyment of the housing and related facilities. What are structural changes that can that uh, would need to be made in order to have someone with a dis disability enjoy or have full benefit from a, a particular uh, dwelling unit? We call those reasonable modifications. And reasonable modification simply means that this is something that a landlord should be doing. A landlord must make their properties reasonably modified structurally, if you will, uh, in order to uh, be uh, convenient and be desirable to someone with a dis disability. What's reasonable? Well, there's a there's a, a long chapter in this in uh, in uh, the Fair Housing Acts on what is and isn't reasonable. But basically, if it you know doesn't cost the landlord a lot of money, if it's not a major old structural issue that the that the disabled tenant needs. They're, they're responsible for doing it. And that would include, uh, say, wheelchair ramps. That's something that landlords should be paying for to uh, aid not only disabled tenant, tenants, but also to invade uh, to, and also to, uh, to protect and be convenient to, to those with disabilities in a wheelchair that are visiting the property as well. So a reasonable modification would certainly that a landlord must make uh, would be uh, a wheelchair ramp. Uh, other modifications might be they would be making a door wider, for, you know, the entry door into the unit wider for, to accommodate a wheelchair. Not a real expensive build-out. Maybe inside the property they have to uh, drop the uh, light switches lower so they can be accessed by someone with a wheelchair. Those are not big build-out issues, and those would be necessary to be made so a landlord couldn't say, Hey, you know, Mr. Disabled uh, 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 Prospective Tenant, I'm not going to rent to you because I'm not going to put a new door in. Okay, too expensive, or I don't want to do that. Technically, that disabled individual could bring them up before charges uh, in the, in if you will, fair housing court. So reasonable modifications are those that landlords typically have to make in order to uh, to make the the housing uh, you know accommodating to those with disabilities. Channeling prospective buyers or tenants to neighborhoods based on their race, not done a lot any longer, but that was something done, you know, again, back in the 50s, 60s, even up until the 80s, uh, where there would be racial, usually racial steering. And that's where real estate brokers would channel uh, those uh, uh, of various ethnic or racial, uh, racial uh, backgrounds into certain areas, either in the town or within the community or within the, within the region. It was sort of like, here's where you'll be comfortable. There's more of your kind there. Okay, that's steering, and of course, that's an illegal uh, anti an illegal fair housing uh, activity. Could get you into fair housing court as a real estate agent if you practice that. 
Six, the illegal practice of inducing owners to sell their home by suggesting the ethnic or racial composition of a neighborhood is changing. And this would be blockbusting. Technically it happened typically in areas uh, where you'd see blockbusting is where there would be maybe um, a, a color line where you would have certain ethnic makeup on one side of a, uh, of a road, uh, say Western Avenue in Chicago, and, and then on the other side, you'd have another different uh, racial makeup. And what r brokers would do is they would go to uh, one side of the street and say, hey, you better sell your property today because we have this other ethnic group that's encroaching in the area and they're going to be buying properties here and your property value is going to plummet. So you better get out today. List with me. So it was technically a listing uh, a, a ploy that real estate brokers would use because once that sign went up on the other side of the street, a for sale sign, then everybody on that block got panicked and they would then, you know, want to list their property and sell uh, quickly. So if you will, once once a real estate broker was able to put a sign up, a for sale sign, um, you know, based on scaring people on that block of a racial change in their neighborhood, that would break the block. Okay. Or if you will, block the block would be busted. And then other people would list their property very quickly with them, with perhaps them uh, afterwards. So it was basically a listing technique. You would pant, you would peddle your panic. The status of being male or female, uh, that would be sex. Uh, that also uh, does apply to uh, um, not only people of their um, of the sexual uh, of what their sex was upon their birth, but it also affects people uh, who are uh, you know if you will questioning or maybe are gender fluid. So this also includes uh, those those as well. Okay, those people as well that are, uh, if you will, gender fluid or um, gender seeking uh, and those that um, are uh, are of, you know, a, a, a different uh, uh, mindset to, to whether they're male or female or neither in some cases. So that's considered sex. Now, you can't discriminate against people because of sex. And that includes more than just your biological sex. Eight, someone who pretends to be interested in buying or renting property from someone suspected of unlawful discrimination, those would be testers. So the Fair Housing Acts do allow for testers to basically, I guess the word would be entrap, although the Supreme Court does not call it entrapping. Uh, real estate brokers or others who might be suspected of unlawful discrimination. So testers can come in and test you and see how they're treated and, 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 and see if perhaps you're engaging in uh, illegal fair housing activities. So it's not enough just to learn about all the things we're learning about with fair housing. Uh, you need to be on guard that you can be tested for it as well. So you need to, if you will, sort of, uh, if we're, if we're going to preach fair housing, that needs to be practiced every day. Or you may find these testers bringing you in, into fair housing court, which you don't want to go to. Changes in rules, policies, practices, or services to allow equal opportunity to use and enjoy a dwelling unit. These changes would be called reasonable accommodations. Accommodations are changes in rules or practices. Modifications, reasonable modifications that we talked about earlier are actual physical uh, structural changes to uh, make uh, property, usually rental units, uh, accommodating to the disabled. Reasonable accommodations mean you have to change your rules to accommodate those with disabled. So an example might be that Let's say you have a disabled tenant that wants to rent one of your units. It's unit 101. You tell them this probably wouldn't be good for you. Sorry, we can't rent to you because unit 101's parking space is way over there on the other side of the, you know, the, the complex. And, and that's just part of our rules. Our, our rules are that your parking place matches your, uh, the, the, the number on your unit. 
And uh, so in that case, you're going to have to change your rule for that disabled tenant and not give them unit 101, but give them to, to park at uh, space 101 that matches unit 101, but to give them uh, a space that's, you know, closer, more convenient uh, to their their the front door of their unit, if you will. So reasonable accommodations are changing your rules and regulations to accommodate the disabled. The place in which a person or one of his or her ancestors was born, ancestry, and of course that's the that's what everybody does now, isn't it? With the ancestry.com, everybody's got to find out who their ancestors were. And when we we get those back, we're often surprised, okay, who our ancestors really are. People we thought were our ancestors for many years, we find out they're we're actually from a different country. The actual or perceived heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, or gender-related identity, that would be uh, sexual orientation. A little bit different than um, sexual, uh, sexual uh, under sex, sex identity. Okay, gender-related identity is a little different than, uh, than if you will, uh, the protection under sex. So th there, there's kind of a gray area where they cross over. So sexual orientation primarily was uh, initially put in there to protect uh, those uh, homosexuals uh, and bisexuals uh, uh, when that became sort of issue maybe in the, you know, the 1980s, maybe the 1970s. That was sexual orientation, okay? It doesn't really have to do with your sex as such. Okay, you're, you're male or female. Uh, it's who you're attracted to. 12, the household where the person is a, our parents or our guardians of a minor child. And that would be the fam familial status. So that's a protected status. It protects individuals with children under the age of 18 from their parents and, and their family, if you will, being discriminated against because of the child. So if I were renting some property, if I were leasing some property, and uh, let's say a, a, a single woman came in with, let's say a child that was 10, uh, I couldn't refuse to rent her a unit based on the fact that she had a child that was, I couldn't say, well, we don't like children in the area, so we're not going to rent to you. Okay. Again, that landlord would find themselves in fair, could find themselves in, in fair housing court. So familial status applies to families or individuals and or guardians uh, that have any child under the age of 18. This also applies, incidentally, to pregnant women. They're also protected under the familial status category. Real quickly on the protected classes, let's kind of review those a little bit. Again, we have our federal fair housing uh, protected classes, and then we have those protected under the Illinois Human Rights Act. And we'll see that as, uh, as counties and as cities develop their own fair housing acts, they have to add to the ones that are already there on the, on, from, their federal, from the federal and state acts. You can't subtract, you have to keep adding. So the federal, the Illinois Human Rights Act are going to add protected classes from and include the federal ones and then add some additional ones. And we'll talk about those. Age is not covered under the Federal Fair Housing Act, but it is covered under the, human, uh, the Illinois Human Rights Act. And that is considered 40 or over. So if you're 40 or over, you can't be discriminated against as you're looking for housing. Again, Typically, we're talking about rentals. Ancestry, national origin, that's covered, protected under both federal and state act. Color, under both federal and state fair housing acts. Disability, under federal uh, and state fair housing acts. Familial status, again, under both. Height, of course, is not covered under either. There's no protection on your height for, for fair housing uh, incidences. Marital status, not under the federal, but we do have marital status covered under the Illinois Human Rights Act. So technically, I couldn't discriminate against, let's say, opposite sex tenants who were not married. Uh, there is a little religious uh, um, wiggle room that some 
uh, landlords might be able to qualify for saying that it violates their, you know, their religious beliefs, not having unmarried uh, opposite sex couples in the units. Uh, it gets a little bit, or if you will, challenging to prove that. So basically, marital status prevents landlords from discriminating against uh, unmarried couples, and I suppose maybe in some cases married couples. You don't want married couples. I suppose that 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 might happen, uh, particularly if you're talking about same-sex uh, couples. So there is that marital status protection in Illinois. Order of protection status, not under the federal, but under the Illinois Human Rights Act. And what order of protection status is, is it's a protection against uh, the the individual that's leasing the property and let's we'll just say uh, a woman takes out a order of protection status uh, against let's say her f former boyfriend who who might, might be harassing her so she takes him to court and now he's not supposed to be within whatever 100 feet of of her or whatever at all times uh, if I'm a landlord and I know that a woman t had an order of protection status against someone I couldn't say well gee you know, I, that that's puts my other tenant, but you, if you were leasing here, that might put my other tenants uh, under some duress or maybe under some danger because maybe that person that you put the order of protection status against may be coming back someday and creating some problems with the other tenants. So I'm not going to rent to you. So the order of protection status is to protect the person that filed the order of protection status, not the person it was filed against. Race, under both. Religion, under both. Again, sex we talked about, under both. Sexual orientation, uh, under the, uh, the Illinois Human Rights Act. Sexual orientation for the federal acts is really protected really under sex. Okay. So there isn't a separate sexual orientation uh, for the federal act, but it is protected under sex. Hopefully we made that clear earlier as we talked about that. So both the orientation, your sexual, you know, who you're attracted to, as well as your uh, feeling of your, um, your, your, your sexual, uh, you know, male, female, or, or uh, if you're uh, questioning or, you know, any, any of those other uh, categories. Source of income is protected under the Illinois Human Rights Act. Um, I couldn't. Let's just say you're a waitress and you want to rent from me, and uh, your 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 income basically comes from tips. So I couldn't say, well, I'm not going to rent to you because who knows how your tips are going to go, and because they vary wildly, maybe you won't be able to make your mortgage payments to me. I mean, I'm sorry, your your rental payments to me. So therefore, because of your source of income, I'm, I refuse to rent to you. Again, that's going to be uh, that's going to be um, protected under the Illinois Human Rights Act. Weight currently, there's no protection uh, for anybody because of their weight, sort of like height. True or false? Someone who has AIDS is considered disabled under the Americans with Disability Act. That's actually true. And because under the Americans with Disability Act, it's considered a, a disability, uh, if someone who has AIDS or is H, who has AIDS or HIV positive, that means as a real estate agent, if you're aware of somebody that has AIDS because it is considered a disability, you have to keep that confidential. Uh, if you had listed, let's say you had listed some property, and uh, buyer's agent says, "Gee, we're we're curious. Uh, we hear that that, that this, you know the one or both of the sellers had AIDS. Is that true? You can't disclose that. Okay, you have to keep that confidential. Uh, vice versa, if, uh, the seller should ask about the whether or not buyers have have AIDS or HIV positive. Again, that's confidential. Cannot disclose that." The Fair Housing Act exempts owner-occupied residents of one to five units. That's false. It's one to four units. So if you are an owner of, let's say, a four flat, and you reside in one of the units, 
and you don't use discriminatory advertising and you don't use a broker, technically you can discriminate, but not because of race. Uh, let's say an example would be, I have a four flat, I own it, I live in one of the units and I have three other men living in the other units and, and we only wanna have men, allow men to live in our four, four flat. Uh, I, I could refuse uh, any woman that came in and wanted to rent on the basis that she was a woman and I only rent to, to men. Okay, N not considered uh, a fair housing violation. Okay, but again, I can't be using a broker to help me market the property or screen tenants and I can't be using discriminatory advertising. In other words, I couldn't put a sign out in front of my house that says room for rent, no women allowed. That would violate that and I would lose that protection. So if I just put room for rent and then as people, came, if women came in, I would tell them, no, you can't do that, then that would be okay. So there is that exemption to owner occupied one, two, four units to in some cases, uh, not all cases, but in some cases uh, discriminate legally. The FHA is the enforcement arm of the Federal Fair Housing Act. No, it's not the FHA, it's HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. They enforce the Federal Fair Housing Act. And while I'm on it, who enforces the Illinois Human Rights Act? That's the Illinois Human Rights Commission. So HUD uh, is the enforcement arm of the Federal Fair Housing Acts. If you have a complaint, you take it to a HUD field office in, near where you're at and file your complaint. If you feel like you've been discriminated against or, uh, or um, under any of the protected classes that we've talked about. Uh, or you could take it to the Illinois Human Rights Commission and file your complaint with them if it was a state violation, if you will. A real estate office must remove barriers that it impact equal access, yes. All public accommodations, as we first started talking about when we first started this lesson, all public accommodations must remove barriers for, for the disabled. And that would include uh, places, as we said, places of commerce. It would include uh, 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 sporting events. It include restaurants. It include governmental offices, office buildings, uh, retail centers shopping centers, if you will, all have to remove barriers for, uh, for the disabled. Offering a home for sale at different terms to a member of a protected class is not illegal as long as the house is ultimately sold to that person. No, it's still an illegal act, even if that, you know, uh, protected class individual ultimately buys it. A property manager can tell a prospective tenant that an available unit is already rented if he does not want the liability of running to a woman with kids in a building with a pool. Of course, that is going to be a violation of the uh, of the fair of both the uh, federal and state uh, st uh, fair housing statutes, uh, as it uh, violates the familial status rights of that particular individual. Lenders can outline entire neighborhoods where they will not make loans if there is a significantly high number of defaults in that specific neighborhood. Nope, that would be called steering and that's illegal. Eight, the owner of a single family home working without a real estate license may refuse to rent the home to someone of a specific religion. Uh, uh, that is actually true that does fall under that one to four unit uh, that we talked about before. Uh, but again, not because of race. You cannot uh, discriminate because people of your race. But as an individual uh, seller who's uh, not using a broker and not using uh, illegal advertising, they could technically uh, refuse to rent to somebody because of their religion. Nine, only the person discriminated against has standing to sue for violations. No, anybody who feels they have been harmed by the discriminatory action of a, let's say in this case, real estate broker uh, or real estate salesperson uh, can, can file a suit with HUD. And that's what testers do. Testers, if they go out and they find out that your 
in fact, engaging in fair housing, illegal fair housing activities, they can file a suit on behalf of themselves. And if an award, if a monetary award is, is, is uh, awarded, uh, it will go to the testers. The owner of a property for rent must allow a tenant in a wheelchair to install a ramp to make the property accessible. And I would say, yeah, they do. But, you know, the 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 landlord uh, owner uh, should be installing that. that that's a reasonable uh, modification they should be making. But certainly if the tenant wanted to uh, install a wheelchair ramp under a wheelchair ramp under their own expense, you certainly couldn't deny them from doing that. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 uh, is the first act that prohibits race. You don't have to know the date, but I, I, I do think you need to know that that Civil Rights Act of 1866 also makes race the predominant uh, major uh, fair housing protected class. Familial status applies to households where children are age 18 or under. Those who have been illegally discriminated against in housing may file a complaint with when, within one year of the alleged in incident. So if you feel like you've been discriminated against, you have one year to bring that case to HUD or to the uh, Illinois Human Rights Commission. The Illinois Human Rights Act prohibits discrimination against anyone uh, age 40 or over. So that's, quote, old age in Illinois, protected uh, only in Illinois. Uh, age is not protected under the federal statutes. It's a violation of fair housing laws to refuse to sell, to rent, or to negotiate with someone on the base of, uh, basis of their membership in a protected class. So that's what the fair housing laws are intended to do. And just as a side note, um, if you're dealing with the seller that wants you to participate in illegal fair housing, in other words, refusing to sell to, let's say, certain people because of their ethnicity or their race or their religion, if they're asking you to do that, uh, you can't follow that, that, that uh, their, their uh, wish. Um, you would be as, uh, as guilty as they will be of fair housing violations. So you have to tell them that if they're insistent on your uh, engaging in fair housing activities, you have to leave that transaction, cancel your contract with them and walk away. Okay. The US, U.S. Supreme Court and Jones versus Mayer confirmed that one cannot discriminate on the basis of race with no exceptions. Basically, this has to do with that Civil Rights Act of 1866. It actually confirmed that act is what it did. I don't think you really have to know Jones versus Mayer, but you, you know, you, you, you want to double down knowing that that Civil Rights Act of 1866 that protects race has already been challenged at the Supreme Court, and that's been held as a valid law. Seven, multifamily residential property with four or more units must meet handicapped accessible standards if built after, you don't have to know this, 1991, uh, that's the Americans with Disability Act, okay? Uh, that's when the public accommodations uh, part of that act was, was put into uh, effect. I don't think you have to know 1991, but you, you do want to know the Americans with Disability Act. Eight, advertising an available apartment unit only in specific foreign language newspapers of a city could be considered an example of illegal steering or channeling. This is kind of a little weird here to some degree, but think about it. What they're saying then is uh, if you're going to do advertising in media, try to do it in a variety of media. Don't just do it in one you know, language, if you will. Uh, if, if you have property, let's say, in a Hispanic neighborhood, you know, you might want to advertise that also in the, you know, the, the Eastern European or Ukrainian neighborhood or in a Greek neighborhood paper. Okay, uh, so select papers of other foreign languages in addition to, in this case, we're referring to Spanish, uh, so that you're not just trying to steer or channel Hispanics into that area, okay, showing that you're... You're, 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 that 
this property is has access uh, to all people. It's, you're inviting all individuals uh, into this property, not just those that, let's say, uh, that are Hispanic. That would be considered a, a steering or channeling. Nine, sexual harassment is considered a violation of the Illinois Human Rights Act. So if you were wondering where would I file a sexual harassment case in Illinois, you would file it with the Illinois Human Rights Commission because it's part of the Illinois Human Rights Act, sexual harassment. Ten, someone leasing housing for older persons is exempt from considering familial status of all occupants in the building if at least 62, if they're at least 62 years of old or 80% of the units have someone who is age 55 or older. Now, this is a little technical, so kind of bear with me a little bit. So what we're saying is that there is a way that some properties can uh, qualify for senior housing facilities, and therefore they could deny a, a someone with a child, if you will, those that would be claiming their uh, familial status. Uh, you could, you know, overcome that if in your housing complex, 100% uh, of all of the tenants, those signing leases, are 62 or older, or 80% of the occupants in that housing development were 55 or older. Okay, that would uh, that would uh, you 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 could then qualify as a senior housing, and therefore you could uh, lawfully discriminate against people with children. Again, 100%, 62 or older of the tenants; those are signing leases. The, the other is occupants, just people living there. If 80% of the occupants are 55 or older, again, that could qualify as senior housing. Okay, uh, your goal now is to go on to scenario number one in your book, The Disabled Buyer, and do parts 1-1 to parts 1-4, and then come back to the video on that.